Hey, what's going on guys? My name is Shane. For those who are new, welcome back if you're returning. In my last video talking about the Micah Miller case, there was a pastor who was invited to preach a sermon at Solid Rock in January named Jesse Duplantis. I just did a whole video covering his sermon, so I'll link that down below. But today it was brought to my attention that the sermon that J.P. Miller performed the morning after he found out that his wife was deceased. Another channel, a link down below, claims they got exclusive access to the sermon again. They didn't want to upload the sermon entirely due to copyright reasons. However, they did pull a few clips from his sermon and talked about it. Keep in mind, the entire sermon with Jesse Duplantis, most of it I was covering uh, the allegation that maybe there might be some ties to organized crime, or at least had been because Jesse himself had said um, or alluded to a few illegal activities of his own. He said he, no more. He was reformed and had gotten saved and met Christ. But he did himself openly admit to maybe not, <laughs> the, the statues of limitations had not run out the way he put it. Boom! You popped that! So when I was starting to dive into the clips of this lost sermon, I, my jaw almost hit the floor. So, um, you know Al Capone? Right? Some of y'all northerners remind me of Al Capone. But anyway, so Al Capone, he, uh, he was in charge of the mafia, right? Well, he had a lawyer. His lawyer's name was Easy Eddie, which I wouldn't mind having him as a lawyer. But anyway, Easy Eddie had no integrity. He would do anything to keep Capone out of jail. He was very successful, and he was compensated greatly for his efforts. Why is it that not only a guest that you invited to your church to perform, to preach a sermon, bring up La Casa Nostra, which is a Sicilian mafia? I was with La Cosa Nostra. You know what the La Cosa Nostra is? The mafia. And then J.P. Miller himself is bringing up Al Capone in the Mafia. That's unfortunately the only clip I really got with him um, talking about the Mafia. But I said to myself, there's no way. I had just recorded that entire video about Jesse and deep diving into the Sicilian Mafia. I wish I had a live reaction. That one was coming from a clip that the Robbie Harvey had just posted. So when I had clicked on his video immediately, he brought up the second channel we're going to be taking a look at. A YouTube channel by the name of Check My Church has obtained the lost sermon of John Paul Miller in Solid Rock Church. This is the sermon that John Paul preached just hours after the death of his wife, Micah. Remember, according to police, Micah Miller took her own life in a North Carolina state park just hours before this sermon. And keep this in mind, John Paul Miller, her husband, has yet to see her body or meet with officials when he takes the stage. We have talked about this before. When the sermon first came to surface and people started picking apart the way that JP had basically announced his wife uh, unaliving herself, immediately it raised red flags. When I started covering this case, that was one of the first things that I talked about was just the way that he announced it was really unusual. But we do know that Micah's unaliving or whatever happened to her had happened the day before on Saturday. So JP found out his words you'll see momentarily that late that night he gets a phone call from law enforcement letting him know that his wife unalived herself in North Carolina. You would think with him just saying late last night and now you're up probably between the hours of 9 and 11 a.m. for a Sunday church service. He talks about things he probably should not know yet. This is an open investigation. How are you then unless you are sure because that would be quite embarrassing to announce this and be dead wrong that your wife unalived herself in, in, in front of an entire church. And I don't believe JP would do that unless he believed his story or believed that people would believe his story. So we're going to get into Check My Church. It's pretty cool. They actually go through, um, again, the clips of the service that they felt was worth talking about. Even JP is talking about uh, verses from the Bible and this channel is like, no, no, you're interpreting that wrong. So really interesting watch. We're going to get into it. Hey guys, this is Sarah Young with Check My Church. And if you're not familiar with us, we are a Christian watchdog and discernment ministry. 
And we check churches and ministries for red flags of abuse, corruption, and cult-like control to protect God's sheep and stop feeding the wolves. So she gives you a brief introduction about what they do. I think this is pretty cool. I've never seen a channel like this. I'm really glad that I was brought to this channel today. So again, they're going to just go through and voice their own opinions. I'll throw in my own opinions as well. You might also be wondering how the sermon ended up coming back up online. And Check My Church does explain that for us. A whistleblower reached out and we have the full deleted sermon from that morning. If you've been paying attention to what we, what's been going on with Solid Rock Church at Market Common since Micah's death, then you know that the church took that sermon down pretty quickly after publishing it on their YouTube channel. But once Micah's death became national news, that moment where J.P. Miller announced her death started getting scrutinized and examined by everyone. And within just a few days of the media frenzy starting, if even that, maybe just a few hours, they took it down, which, you know, by the way, is a form of information control and a huge red flag of deception and cult-like behavior. When churches withhold information from you to protect their image or the pastor's image or to hide the truth for any reason, that's a form of information control. It's manipulative and deceptive. She does make a really good point there about them kind of being able con to control like, oh, we're going to keep this up there because it's getting good reaction versus, oh, we're going to take that down because we're getting backlash. I do find that a bit hypocritical of uh, the church leaders. So we're in a sermon series called Pastor to Palace. This is the longest series I've ever preached. And our memory verse is Psalm 75 verse 7. Put it up there. And so I expect that y'all have this thing because we have more Catholics in this service than we do the second service. So y'all are good at memorizing things, right? Catholics? Right, okay, here we go. So we're going to move it off the screen. We're going to say, good and strong, ready, go. Promotion does not... All I hear is women the whole time. Women do talk a lot, so yeah, that makes sense. Okay. I don't know why they keep bringing up Catholics so much. I noticed that in Jesse's uh, sermon as well, where he kept bringing up like the father. I, I, I'm not. I haven't. I haven't been to a Catholic church since I was a child. But the like the that prayer, that prayer. You know what I'm talking about if you're Catholic. That prayer. That was brought up in Jesse's sermon. It's being brought up again in uh, JP sermon. I don't get that. He talks about the amount of Catholics that's in this sermon versus the next sermon. So I don't know. Okay, so here in this first clip, before we get into the content of the sermon, let's just think about the context in which JP is preaching the sermon. He has supposedly just learned the night before that his wife is deceased, supposedly self-inflicted, despite what many of us believe about the true cause of death to Micah. Let's assume, for argument's sake, that he did just learn about his wife's self-inflicted death the night before giving this sermon. So far, he's smiling, joking, and acting like nothing horrible, traumatic, or life-changing has just happened. To me, he's not acting like someone who's just been given terrible, tragic news. And this is not the behavior of someone who has just learned that their wife of 10 years, or however long they were married, even if they were married today, to to just hear that news and to get up the next morning and go to work like it's no big deal. That's, that's a huge red flag for me, regardless of whether he's responsible for her death directly or not. I think we can safely say that he is not grief stricken here. He's not upset. He's not even phased. When we see interviews with Micah's family, on the other hand, with her father and her sister, we can see the pain and the grief in their eyes and in their body language, especially Sierra, Micah's sister. My heart just breaks for her. Every time I see her in an interview or the video she recently posted on TikTok, to me, she is clearly grief stricken. So I don't see that in J.P. Miller at all. He must know in the back of his head at the end of the sermon he's going to make this announcement. I have not seen Sierra's TikTok, so I'm going to see if I can pull that up real quick. I'm not seeing the specific one that she's showing on 
uh, her video, but I found this one from May 6th. It's reposted by a channel called Wounds to Wisdom. I could not find Sierra's like actual TikTok. I found a bunch of fake accounts or girls that shared the same name or same username. This one's about two minutes long, so let me see what this one is all about. I don't think I'm going to be able to share this one on the screen, so if you guys want to listen, I will just react to the audio. I'll include a screenshot so you can see what I'm looking at, but it's just Sierra basically talking to herself on her phone, um, but we'll just react to the audio. I was going to make this video with music in the background and try to hide how sleepy I am and how sleepy my voice is. I'm sure you guys are aware that we have not been getting sleep. We have not been, we have not had time to grieve because we've been seeking justice. And my mom found out about Mike passing away. That's the first thing I said to her. She said, I'm, I'm getting on a plane. I'm trying to, I'm trying to get money and, and fly out there to see you. Um, I don't know if I'm driving, if I'm flying, but I'm coming. And I said, mom, don't come here if you're ready to grieve because we're not there yet. We're still in the stage of fighting. We are still fighting for Micah. We are still fighting for answers. And we are still fighting to make sure that what she started is finished. I don't mean interrupt, but can you just not see the difference based off of just what we saw of JP? Even if it was a short clip, we're about to see more. So just keep in mind, this is an actual grieving sister. I can't imagine how Sierra is feeling right now. I think she saw all the red flags right there along Micah and was willing to do anything to help her. Even they say they continue to look for justice and we will do the same. So let's keep going. And in keeping with that, I thought, well, what would Micah do right now? And I said she would make a video. So... As you may have noticed, most of her videos had a song and that was something that was going on in her life and um, she wanted to reach more people by singing a song and just saying, hey, this is the song's lyrics, this is how I'm feeling right now and I hope you go listen to the song and that it resonates with you as well. And the song that keeps coming to me is... Oh, okay, I, I'm probably going to have to, um, I don't think I'm going to be able to play that part because of copyright reasons. Let me just skip ahead a second uh, if, and see if she finishes singing. No, the rest of TikTok is her singing. Beautiful voice. I just, again, trying to avoid strikes here. Anyway. Okay, so make sure I'm not too loud, Cole, wherever you're at. So, so here's what we're doing today. So we're in 2 Samuel chapter 4. If you got your Bibles, we're in 2 Samuel 4. But listen, so we're, you know we're doing chapter by chapter of David's life. So hear me out. you got to pay attention real close to this. There's a story in 2 Samuel 4 that's just a few verses long, and the ending of that story is in 2 Samuel 9 after David is king. So I could have taught this today, or I could have taught it in four weeks when we get to 2 Samuel 9. I chose to do it today. So when I tell you the ending of the story, even though David's already king, in our timeline, he's not really king yet. Okay, I'm just telling you the end of the story. Do you understand what I'm saying? You sure? Okay, good. And you wouldn't tell me if you didn't, so it's okay. So let me build up to 2 Samuel 4, and you'll see why I'm telling you this, okay? 1 Samuel 15, 23, Samuel said, Your pride is as bad as witchcraft. You refuse instruction. You're no longer king. So that's referring to Saul. So Saul had every opportunity to obey God, every opportunity, and he wouldn't do it. Now listen real close. He had sons. One of his sons' name was He's not the only one who's Jonathan. Everybody say Jonathan. I taught you about him and David's relationship. They were best friends. Jonathan decided, even though my father's not serving God, I'm going to do the right thing. It is very difficult for people to uh, choose the blessing and to choose to serve God when everything around them is, is, is doing the wrong thing. When everybody around them is doing the wrong thing, it's very difficult. Again, I'm sure some of you might have grown up in a house. I'm trying so hard not to make my own comments here. I'm trying so hard, but the irony of what he's preaching right now like that but thank God that you're here today so um, in 1st Samuel 19 2 Jonathan told David my father Saul is trying to kill you in 1st Samuel 20 verse 8 he said we made a covenant we'd always be friends I'll tell you what that means in a second 1st Samuel 23 15 David was afraid because Saul came to kill him but Jonathan encouraged him said don't be afraid don't worry you're going to be the next king of Israel okay so can you see Jonathan doing the right thing even though his dad's doing the wrong thing they made a covenant relationship what that covenant relationship meant was whatever is mine is yours and yours is mine it also meant if you were to pass away, I'll take care of your family. And if I pass away, you take care of my family. Okay, that was the covenant that they had together. So, so that was the second clip. We're going to see what she has to say. Okay, so it's really interesting to me here that JP mentions multiple scenarios in the Bible that involve people dying. And again, he doesn't seem phased by the topic of death 
or people dying in the Bible, even though his wife just died. So again, that seems very odd to me because talking about death should really trigger something in him right now, but he's totally fine. I cannot judge the way that people grieve. I can only base it off of my own experiences. I will let you guys know that I experienced a really, really, really difficult death in my family not even like two weeks ago. And already, like I hear my voice, like it's just not going to happen. It's, we're not going to talk about it. Uh, anything that has to do with death or dying or like any of that right now is really, really, really hard to talk about. Um, again, this isn't the case for everybody. Um, some people can talk about it and they, they, they grieve different ways. They may never cry, but it doesn't mean that they're not grieving in their own way. So I can't necessarily say, oh, because he's not you know, his voice isn't cracking or he's not shedding a tear. He's not necessarily grieving. But I will say that it does seem like he's just very much, it's another Sunday. There just doesn't seem to be any indication whatsoever of emotion. It doesn't even face him. So again, I don't think he's grieving Micah's death at all. If he is, he's definitely not showing it. And he's not showing it really well. But that's, that's it for this clip let's continue uh first samuel 31 verse th verse verse 1 says the philistines fought a battle on mount gaboa the israelites were killed saul and three of his sons died and one of them was jonathan and we read about that a few weeks ago okay so saul and his and jonathan died right okay here we get to second samuel 4 4 now ready when saul and jonathan died jonathan had a son which is saul's grandson named mephibosheth everybody say mephibosheth you shouldn't even have said that because it doesn't even matter because it doesn't matter. I'll, it, honestly, it sounded like y'all were all speaking in tongues. That's what it sounded like, okay? He, he probably spit on the person in front of you. So Mephibosheth was five years old. And so whenever, whenever, whenever Saul and Jonathan died, everyone at the palace thought, well, whoever comes in as king is going to kill us. You know, and David's a mighty warrior. If it's him, he'll definitely kill us. So they all just started running out of the palace. Well, Mephibosheth's nurse grabbed him. And as she was running out of the palace, she fell over and tripped and broke both of his legs. And he became, um, says he became lame for the rest of his life, okay? And he ended up living in a city called Lodabar. Lodabar is the most poverty-stricken city in that region. So here's, here's, he's got royal blood flowing through his veins, and he's living in poverty, and he's begging for money and begging for food. It's almost like a prodigal son story, right? You belong, you belong with the rest of the family. You belong here in the palace. You belong, you, you're supposed to have good things in life, but it, and it's, it's running through your blood, but for some reason you're living in poverty. You're living in sickness, disease, and so forth. Okay, so um, David becomes king, right? And we'll talk about that you know, in the next few weeks. But for this story, we're going to say he's king. In 2 Samuel 9, verse 1, David's at the palace, and he says this to everybody. Hey, is there anybody left from the house of Saul that I can show kindness to for Jonathan's sake? Why, why did he do that? Well, him and Jonathan had a covenant. Now, now Jonathan's dad's trying to kill him, but him and Jonathan had a covenant because Jonathan was doing the right thing. And so the servant said, well, Jonathan had a son, King David. He had a son. His name's Mephibosheth, and he's, he's living in poverty. He's in Lodabar. He can't walk. He's no good for nothing. And David said this, bring him to the palace. So they go pick up Mephibosheth, they bring him to the palace, and in 2 Samuel 9, verse 7, David said to him, don't be afraid, I'm going to show you kindness, here's why, because your dad made a decision that honored God. Now your granddad wasn't doing the right thing, but your dad was doing the right thing, because nothing you did, because your dad, I'm bringing you here in the palace, and I'm going to give you back the land that was your grandfather's, and you're going to eat with me at my table as one of the king's sons. So today in part 15 for your notes, we're going to talk about this, be generational minded. Be generational minded. Uh, the life that we live on earth, it doesn't just affect us as individuals. It affects everyone that comes after us. It affects the people that we leave behind. In the Old Testament, they would pray to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I think that's so interesting, especially because remember, Jacob wasn't even right at the time. God changed his name to Israel after he you know, gave his life to, to, to God. But God said, you know what? I want to keep it, Jacob. You keep praying to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I want everybody to know I'm the God of imperfect people as well. But it was, he was a generational. They were always thinking, what can I do for the next generation? What can I do for the next generation? On and on. And so it affects those that come after. Okay, now this is interesting. Here, JP seems to get emotional. Sir, you can't even get emotional for your deceased wife who passed away less than 24 hours ago. You, you're getting emotional for a... 
if it's genuine emotion, I'm not sure because even though his voice gets shaky and his eyes look a little red, he shakes it off within a few seconds. I wouldn't even call it shaking it off. He just gets right back into the sermon and moves on seamlessly. The emotion just totally dissipates within a few seconds. I've watched a few of JP's other sermons, and he seems to do this in his sermons a lot, where he acts emotional over a specific point he's making or something, but then it just very quickly disappears, and he continues on as if as if he wasn't just emotional. And something I've learned from the behavior panel, which is a panel of four of the top body language and human behavior experts in the country, maybe the world, I don't know. But what I've learned a lot from watching their channel is how to detect when emotion is fake. And genuine emotion doesn't dissipate like this, this quickly. People don't just start crying and then stop within seconds and carry on with their speech or conversation with a completely different emotion or lack of emotion when they're genuinely emotional. So this here to me is fake emotion. Also, I remember when I used to go to church as well, my pastor would put a lot of emotions just into like some of the stories that they'd share from the Bible. And I think it was just kind of a way to, emotion is impactful and it's memorable. Another reason I think it's fake is because I don't feel any emotion in response to it. I'm an emotional person. when. People are genuinely upset, even if it's just an actor playing a role in a movie. If the emotion is genuine, and actors do pull their emotions from genuine places when they're good actors, when they do that, I get upset and I cry every time. If I'm watching a speech or a sermon and the pastor or a speaker is genuinely emotional, I cry every time without fail there too. And even if they don't cry, <laughs> I can tell when people are holding it in and I cry. I could never see somebody crying and not cry if they were genuine. I just feel horrible. I feel I feel for them. I can't help it. My eyes will just start stinging and I, they just start watering. JP didn't make me feel anything but the ick. <laughs> so a red flag for me when watching pastors like JP Miller here who display emotions in their sermons because emotionalism is a very commonly used tactic of man manipulation in the Christian church. So if I don't feel anything in response to a pastor's supposed emotions, and I know this might not seem like the most objective measure, but it's just my intuition, which I trust based on my experiences. But if someone is acting emotional and that doesn't tr trigger any emotions in me, I know they're not genuinely hurting or I would feel bad for them. I could be wrong, but I do feel like you have to lack a certain sense of empathy to be able to put trackers on your wife's car um, or have a private investigator allegedly put trackers on your wife's car. Um, we listened to the phone call that Sierra and Micah had made to 911 with the threats that JP was giving. Like, he doesn't really seem like a very empathetic person. So I think faking emotion is probably very easy for him. Considering he's in the public eye all the time, I think he's very used to talking to people and is very good at telling people what they want to hear. Also, though, this is a strange time to get emotional, I think, too, because he's crying over the impact of people on, you know, the impact of people on their descendants who he doesn't even know personally. So this isn't just fake emotion, but it seems like misplaced emotion. And it seems weird to get emotional in this moment too. Because of all the talk about death, that, that seemed like a more in a, a more appropriate time to get emotional. I believe they did a second part as well we can check into in our next video. I do want to back, jump back quickly into the Robbie Harvey's video because I think the most important part of this sermon was the very end when JP is actually announcing Micah's passing. We're not going to do an altar call today. Instead, um, instead um, I'm going to have you stand up and I'm going to make an announcement. And um, after the announcement, I'm going to ask that you... Um, you leave church quietly and, and don't talk about the announcement here in the building, please, if you can. So y'all can stand to your feet. Um, before I make the announcement, I also want to say that um, my request to you is that you will continue to come to church and serve and give 
um, for the next you know little bit. Cause I don't want to have. I'm taking a little bit of a break, and I don't want to have to worry about the church. My break may be a few days, a few weeks. I don't know. Um, I got a call late last night. My wife has passed away. And yeah, it was uh, it was self induced, and it was uh, up in North Carolina. And um, we're gonna have a funeral for her next Sunday here at 3 p.m. And so um, it's, it's all I can. Yeah, I'm I'm just kind of going on um, adrenaline right now. So y'all pray for me and my kids and everybody. But do you hear when he said, I got a call late last night that Micah passed away. And he's up and early Sunday morning. It was uh, it was self-induced, and it was uh, up in North Carolina. How would you know that if it's still an ongoing investigation, and you just got a call last night, and this is the next morning? But again, you're not going to tell the entire church this news unless you know, or you think you know, or you want to make people think you know for sure how it happened or build a narrative right which is what he does next and um we're gonna have a funeral for her next sunday here at 3 p.m wait a minute how do you already have how do you already have the time how do you already have a funeral planned so you know where you know when you know how and you know what time the funeral is what all within 12 hours? That makes no sense. Come on. And so, um, it's, it's all I can, yeah, I'm, I'm just kind of going on um, adrenaline right now. So, y'all pray for me and my kids and everybody. And uh, she was, she wasn't, y'all knew that she wasn't well mentally. And that uh, she needed her, her medicine that was hard to get to her. Uh, there's a little bit of music coming on. But even the fact that she's like, yeah, remember, she has mental problems. I kept, you know, just want to make sure you guys remember that she had mental problems. Why would you even say that? Okay, not once in my entire life have I learned or like somebody announced the passing of somebody. Unless it was like they were battling a terminal illness for a long time. But if it's like a sudden out of the blue tragic event like that unless it was somebody really close to me not once have I just been told right away how somebody passed because that's not necessarily something that somebody who's grieving wants to talk about let me know what you think below and I will see you guys in my next one